This podcast episode was brought to you by Audible.com. Audible is the place for audiobooks. With over 100,000 titles, you can find any book you want to listen to on Audible.com. Right now, I'm listening to Edward Abbey's Desert Solitaire. Now, it's not exactly science fiction, and it's not exactly science, but in this special episode, I'm going to be talking a lot about nature. And Edward Abbey's Desert Solitaire is about his time working at the National Park. So I want to recommend this book, Edward Abbey's Desert Solitaire, or any book of your choosing you can get free from Audible with a free trial subscription. All you have to do is use my special link. It is audibletrial.com slash fact and sci-fi. That's audibletrial.com slash fact and sci-fi for your free audiobook. Welcome to Fact and Science Fiction, the podcast about science and science fiction. I'm your host, Carly, and this episode, if you've already checked the title, this won't be a spoiler. It's about animal behavior, specifically animal mimicry and John Carpenter's The Thing. So if you're a patron or Patreon supporter, you may have seen the post a while back about my next couple of episodes. This episode I wanted to do about animal behavior. It was one of my favorite courses in undergrad, but I had like two experiences pretty close together that inspired me for this specific episode. One, I watched John Carpenter's The Thing, which I had seen before. This time I watched it with Jess and a couple friends, and um, it was a really fun time. And then We also, Jess and I, for her birthday weekend, we went to the Omaha Zoo, which if you haven't been to the Omaha Zoo, it is amazing. I've been to the San Diego Zoo. I've been to a couple other zoos, but this one has to be my favorite. It's very immersive. They put a lot of investment in recreating natural habitats. Uh, You definitely feel like a visitor, not just a traditional walking around looking at animals in enclosures. So I definitely recommend it. Um, It's rated one of the best zoos in the country, if not the world. And they have a really good insect exhibit and a butterfly house. They had a really cool little window into, into the section in which they grow a bunch of butterflies from larval stage to the cocoons and you got to see them like emerge from the cocoons and dry off it was amazing and one of the specimens in there was the owl butterfly which you've probably have seen um, pictures of they're very famous for uh, recreating eye spots that look like owl or other uh, birds of prey eyes that ward off predators And we also saw like a couple other exhibits of insects like walking sticks. And it just made me think of watching the thing and um, mimicry, basically how organisms can ward off predators or trick prey using camouflage and using their bodies to look like other animals. So that is the origin of this episode. I'm going to be talking about different types of animal mimicry, including um, defensive mimicry and offensive or aggressive mimicry. I'm going to be using examples from The Thing. If you love animals, if you love the weird animal behaviors and the really cool effects of adaptation and evolution, uh, stay tuned. So just in the last week or so, I don't know if you've seen it, but it was a viral tweet about, it was a short little video of a snail with like strobing colorful eye stalks. It looked wild. It looked psychedelic. These bright colors from the snail, um, its eyes were just uh, vibrating, pulsing color 
from its eye stocks. And the tweet text was about how it was a zombie snail. And his and its eyes were like that because a worm had infected it. And it was um, creating that strobing color in order to mimic a caterpillar so that a bird would eat it. And then the worm inside could reproduce in that bird. I don't know if I had, I don't think I had heard of that example. It's not the only example of worms infecting other, infecting an intermediate host in order to get eaten by another host so that it can reproduce. It's so wild that a, that evolution would favor a reproductive cycle like that. Like how many times would it have to fail in order for the species to continue, and yet it had to be successful enough that evolution would favor it. So wild. So I wanted to go more into depth about what was happening with that snail, what is this worm, and kind of connect it to the thing. So the flatworm is called Leucochloridium paradoxum. And it uses snails as an intermediate host. A flatworm in its larval state travels into the digestive system of a snail to develop into the next stage, a sporocyst. The sporocyst grows into long tubes to form swollen brood sacs. See, this is where I start to lose it. Filled with tens to hundreds of cercaria, these brood sacs invade the snail's tentacles, preferring the left for some reason. Um, when available. Why wouldn't it be available? Uh, And it causes a brilliant transformation of the tentacles into swollen, pulsating, colorful display that mimics the appearance of a caterpillar or a grub. And the brood sacs tend to change according to light intensity. And in total darkness, they do not pulse at all. So it's definitely, um, you know, evolved to attract predators It doesn't just do that by itself. The flatworm sporocyst definitely controls the behavior of the snail. So for instance, uninfected snails, just regular snails, would, you know, prefer dark darkness to avoid predators. But um, infected snails prefer, like, go out more during the day. They stay out in open spaces longer. They sit higher on vegetation, definitely trying to attract birds. Everything supports that hypothesis. The digestive system in birds is where they will reach, is where this flatworm will reach adulthood. So once a bird comes across this zombie snail that's mimicking a caterpillar, they'll eat it. And then the uh, flatworm inside will reproduce in the bird, and then it will escape through the excretory system. And then these droppings are then consumed by snails, and then it all starts over again. So this is a form of aggressive mimicry. So like I said earlier, there are different types of animal mimicry. This is aggressive in which um, it's uh, called like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Like I said, I don't think I had known about the zombie snail before, but I wasn't exactly surprised. If you'll remember way, way back when, if you've been listening to this podcast for a long time, I had um, Jess on the show and we talked about uh, health and we talked a little bit about cordyceps. And so I'm going to play a little clip uh, just to refresh your memory and to refresh mine. Cordyceps are parasitic fungi that will infect um, insects. The most famous one is the one that infects ants, but they will, an infected ant will be compelled to climb to a certain height in the jungle canopy, latch on with its mandibles to a stem, and just stay there until it dies as its body basically becomes a husk for the cordyceps fungi to grow out of the back of its skull and really spores everywhere. The the pictures of (laughs) 
those um, dead ants with like these stalks coming out of their head and like flowering with these bulbs that will release spores. I mean, it just looks horrible. And their dead eyes have... Ugh. And I haven't even made her play The Last of Us I yet. I don't want to. Um, she thinks it's horrifying when it's ants. Wait until <laughs> it's like someone with a fungus face running out of you from a dark warehouse in the apocalypse. No. So just like the um, the infected snails, these infected ants like leave their nest they and leave their regular trails for the forest floor where it's more humid. Um, basically, it's an area more suitable for, for fungal growth. And that helps the um, parasitic fungus grow and sprout. And there's something that's so similar to the thing when these stalks pop up out of these, these ants' heads. Uh, it just reminds me of that scene in the thing where the stalk pops up out of that guy's head and then it starts to grow legs and crawl around the floor like it is just disgusting. I don't know. There's just something about like stalks just popping out of things. That also reminds me of that episode of Buffy, you know, the one with the egg and like the legs pop out. Immediate horror, just body horror. Another example of like a creepy type of aggressive mimicry are nematodes. A nematode changes the color of the abdomen of workers of the canopy ant Cephalotus atratus, to make it appear like ripe fruit. And then um, it also changes the behavior of the ant so that the rear part is held raised so that predators um, can see more clearly the bright color. And then this presumably increases the chance of the ant being eaten by birds. And then the droppings of birds are collected by other ants and fed to their brood, therefore spreading the the nematode around. So that definitely also reminded me of the thing which uh, changed the behavior of the host, the human, uh, you know, the thing that they was it was mimicking. I guess I'm a little reluctant to call it the host because it's definitely not the human person. It's completely mimicked to the point of the genetic level. Um, but, you know, all of their behavior was to avoid detection of the, um, of the community and then to um, spread, spread the infection, to spread the species around, to get out of the ice. All right. But mimicry is not always done to uh, kill things. It's not always aggressive. So Batesian mimicry is like a sheep in wolf's clothing. So it's like when um, typical prey animals evolve to mimic traits of larger, tougher animals or to mimic like their actual predators in order to ward other predators away. So that increases their chance of survival so that they can escape predators and um, reproduce, and evolution then favors the adaptations that makes them look even closer to um, those bigger, tougher animals. Uh, we see this a lot in insects. Like I said, the butterfly that I saw at the Omaha Zoo, the owl butterfly, that's um, the genus Caligo, Caligo, uh, has huge eye spots. Um, it's found in the rainforests and secondary forests of Mexico, Central, and South America. And I wanted to learn more about this. Like, I know oh, at least a little bit about adaptation so and evolution. And if you do too, then you know that the animals that have those eye spots tend to survive, they tend to re uh, reproduce and pass on those genes to develop those eye spots to their young, and so on and so forth. And that's how it has evolved into, um, into that kind of uh, phenotype. However, scientists in the field wanted to know, is it, what is it about the eye spots that ward off predators? Like, 
you know, according to our human eyes, they definitely look like eyes of a bird of prey or owl. But is it just the uh, organization of the colors that ward off predators? Um, Or do they see an eye spot like, you know, predatory birds um, and such? Do they see what we see? And that's why they avoid these butterflies that have the eye spots. So I looked up a paper um, the authors are Blute, Lilbrandt, Fells, Gurgle, and Lunau from the biology, biology department of Heinrich Hein University, and they studied a feature of the eye spot that looked like the reflecting sparkle of the cornea of a vertebrate. So if you look at pictures of this eye spot, you can often see like this little white, white speck around um, what would be the the cornea or the pupil of the eye spot. It's light colored, um, typically they're crescent shaped or semicircular, and it looks and it makes it look like a spherical eyeball. Like if you look at kids' drawings of humans, um, they or cartoons, they often have that sparkle in it. and they notice like a lot of butterflies with eye spots have, that white speck. And they um, wanted to uh, test whether that speck was important in the uh, anti-predator behavior. Those white um, specks, they look white to our human vision and reflect UV light. So uh, they then deduce that they appear white to other animals as well. And these researchers observed the butterflies with eye spots and observed that 53% of them, so more than chance, had those sparkles. They ran field experiments with dummy butterflies, in which some had sparkles in different places around the eye spot, so not just close to the cornea, um, but, or the, you know, I'm using air quotes, but farther away or to the top or to the bottom, not to the side or the corners. And they found that subjects, the dummy butterflies, with sparkles in a more natural position, you know, the ones that make it look like a spherical eye, uh, elicited a more deterrent effect on the predators. So this just contributes to the body of research that supports um, the hypothesis that these adaptations are meant to look like vertebrate eye vertebrate eyes to avoid predators. It isn't just like these specific colors arranged in such a way ward off predators. It really is meant to recreate vertebrate eyes like owls. Um, We also have examples of insects that use mimicry to mimic inanimate objects, so walking sticks, bugs that look like leaves. Hoverflies um, are a type of fly that look like wasps to ward away predators. So that's all an example of defensive mimicry. So aggressive mimicry would be the kind that like the zombie snail, the flatworm, and then defensive mimicry are when animals try to defend themselves to just ward off predators, just scare them to make predators think that they are harmful or unappetizing. That is defensive mimicry. So flash forward to predatory behavior using mimicry. So this isn't like parasitism that we talked about earlier. This is animals using mimicry to not be detected by the prey and to uh, get access to some resource. So this would be like a wolf in sheep's clothing. So uh, for example, wildcat margays uh, mimic the sounds of young monkeys in order to um, lure other monkeys um, to eat them. Haku bird like use mimicry in multiple ways. So the cuckoo imitates the sound of a hawk to scare away smaller birds from their nests. And then they will, so that's one type of mimicry. And then the cuckoo will lay their eggs in that nest and then fly away so that when these smaller birds come back, they, they aren't smart enough to realize, oh, I have an extra egg. And then they will they will lay on those eggs, the eggs will hatch, and then the baby cuckoos will like, they're bigger so they get more food. Sometimes they will kill other birds in that nest. So it's kind of, uh, I've heard it referred to like the changeling bird. Um, It'll just replace 
another bird's offspring so that it'll get all of the resources. So, and the eggs don't look super similar, but the eggs that do look similar are, you know, they're, uh, that have like similar spots to the host family's bird eggs. They'll definitely get the, those traits passed on more. So that's one example. There's a species of firefly of the genus Photurus. Um, they emit the same light signals of the females of the genus Photinus. So Photurus and Photinus. Um, that the genus Photinus use as a mating signal. But the Photurus fireflies are not using it as an amazing signal. They lure the male Photinus flies in to eat them. They call them femme fatales. So they're purposefully emitting those signals to lure another uh, species of firefly in order to eat them. Mimicry can also be used for sexual selection. So cuttlefish use mimicry. Smaller males have evolved to look similar to females so that they can just, well, first they avoid like uh, aggression from the bigger males, but they can hide, uh, they can just like hang out with the females. The females don't know that they're males. And then when the females are ready to mate, these smaller males will just kind of sneak in, mate real quick, and then swim away. So again, that's just another example of how, like, in the thing, um, the alien species use mimicry to pass on the species, uh, just like these um, examples of sexual selection mimicry. So I think out of all of these examples, hopefully you've learned some new ones. You know, when it comes to horror and science fiction, there's really nothing weirder than the animal kingdom. Like, that's a good place to get inspiration for horror, especially. So we've talked about using mimicry to not be detected by prey, to ward off predators, to use mimicry to help their parasitism behaviors in order to reproduce. We've talked about flatworms, fungus, owl, butterflies, and fish. There aren't a lot of examples of um, vertebrates using mimicry. It's more often used, it's more often observed in insects. Um, but there was a cool example that uh, involved humans, actually. So there is a certain type of weed that has adapted to look like a crop in order to avoid um, being destroyed. It's not exactly evolution because it's happened over such a short period of time. Human farmers are the ones are choosing the selection. Like we are avoiding pulling this weed because we think it's a crop and therefore we're letting those weeds reproduce and the ones that look closest to the crop survive. So that is called Vavilovian mimicry or crop mimicry or weed mimicry. So this has been done manually since the Neolithic times and more recent years by machinery and uh, said it's an example of unintentional selection by humans. So that's just another trivia fact. It hasn't been studied as much as animal mimicry. And uh, they also connect it to like antibiotic resistance and herbicide resistance from plants. So what's the whole point about all of this? I mean, it's interesting just seeing how wild evolution has favored life cycles and favored behaviors so that they work so well. Also, I just think that it's cool that like some of my favorite horror and sci-fi uh, has like a direct link to things that truly happen in the animal kingdom. There's no better inspiration than the animal kingdom for something so weird and so horrifying. If you like this episode, please subscribe um, wherever you get your podcasts. Leave a review on Apple Pods, iTunes, Stitcher. That really helps other people find the show. You can follow the pod on social media, Twitter, Instagram at Fact and Sci-Fi. Or you can find us on Facebook, Fact and Science Fiction Podcast. 
I want to give a shout out to Chan Vargas for giving me a really kind message on Facebook. I really appreciate it. You can support the show in a monetary kind of way by going to patreon.com slash fact and sci-fi. You can get previews of upcoming episodes, stickers, and maybe I can use your idea for a podcast episode. Uh, Just find me on patreon.com slash fact and sci-fi. And lastly, thanks for listening.